Hey everybody, do not boil a young kid in its mother's milk. We are given that command three different times in the Torah and this has made a lot of people scratch their heads for hundreds and hundreds of years wondering what in the world does this mean. So today, let's find out what it really means. Shalom everyone, welcome to Beit Tefillah. The Torah command to not cook a young goat in its mother's milk has baffled people for centuries. It seems almost awkwardly stuck in there in places as almost like an afterthought, like a reminder of sorts. It almost doesn't seem to fit at times. Three times we are given the same command. It's all worded the same and here are all three of them. Exodus 23, 19, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Exodus 34, 26, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Deuteronomy 14, 21, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Very specifically, they all say the same thing using all the same Hebrew words. Now, different Bibles may use a different word for cook. It may be seethe. We've seen that a couple times. But they all come from the same Hebrew word, which is Strong's H1310, Bashal, which is a primitive root, properly to boil up, hence to be done in cooking, bake, boil, bring forth, is ripe, roast, or seethe. The Hebrew word for goat is Strong's H1423, Gedi, it's a young goat or a kid. And milk is Strong's H2461, Chalab, which is cheese, milk, or the act itself of sucking. What a strange thing though, right? I mean, for what reason would anyone ever have to say, hey, I think I'm going to boil a young goat in his mother's milk today? That's kind of sick. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And I remember when we first came into Torah that I jokingly told my wife, wow, don't boil a young goat in his mother's milk. <laughs> I got that one. Check. But let's talk about a couple of different things that people do today of what they think this commandment is about. The halakha of separating meat and milk is a central element of the definition of kosher foods within rabbinic Judaism. The halakha is based on the three verses I just read. For those who don't know, halakha, according to Wikipedia, is the collective body of Jewish religious laws derived from the written and oral Torah. I think we can all agree that sin is never acceptable, not even one time, before Elohim, right? I think we can all agree on that. So keeping that in mind, let's read Genesis 18, 1-8, when Elohim appeared to Abraham. And Yahuwah appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre while he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked and saw three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, Yahuwah, if I have found favor in your eyes, please do not pass your servant by. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And let me bring a piece of bread and refresh your hearts and then go on, for this is why you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So Abraham ran into the tent to Sarah and said, Hurry, make ready three measures of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and hurried to prepare it. And he took the curds and the milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. So, Yahuwah shows up, and there's three messengers, and Abraham feeds them milk and meat, and not one time did any of them say, Hey, wait a minute! This isn't kosher. They seem to be just fine with that. And not only that, it was right after they ate when they told Abraham that he was going to be blessed with the heir, the son that he had wanted for so long, even though him and his wife Sarah were very advanced in age. So apparently, mixing milk with meat when you eat, not a problem for Elohim. Okay, so that should solve a lot of issues right there. But others will try and say, well, we know we cannot sow different seeds in our fields or mix like linen and wool in a garment and do that. So we won't want to mix milk and meat when we eat because that's mixing. Really? So with that line of thought, can we not eat a salad with our steak? Can we not eat a baked potato with our fish? What about the Passover? We eat the lamb with the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread. That has nothing to do with it. Some other people think what the command means go something like this. Do not cook or eat a calf that is still nursing on its mother's milk, in its mother's milk, kind of still 
in you know as in nursing and this seems a little more sound at first when you first hear it than the whole jewish halakha about not eating milk and meat together but is this correct just as with Abraham feeding the messengers of Elohim milk and meat, sin is never acceptable even one time. We just talked about that. So we have to keep that in mind as we read Leviticus 22, 27. When a bull or a sheep or a goat is born, it shall be seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day and thereafter, it is acceptable as an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. Okay, we got to remember that. Now I was raised in the Midwest and there was a lot of farms I would help out on all the time. And I always enjoyed working with the animals. And I can tell you from experience that a calf and a goat and a sheep, they are on their mother's milk for a whole lot longer than one week's time. Now a calf is weaned in about six to eight months and a lamb about 60 days and a goat will average of about three months. So that's about what it is on average. But the whole point is they are in their mother's milk for a whole lot longer than one week so this commandment Leviticus 22, 27, you have to keep that in mind when we're reading that. Now, obviously in the case of this verse in Leviticus, it is speaking of an offering made by fire to Elohim and not just lunch, all right? But remember, Yahuwah is the same across the board when it comes to these things. And some of these sacrifices that were to be done were also required to be eaten by Aharon and his sons or the Levitical priesthood as part of the deal. And we're gonna read that in a minute, so keep that in mind. So what is it then? What exactly would the reason be for anyone to ever decide to boil a young goat in its mother's milk? And why would Elohim give us a command for that? So there had to be a pretty good reason for him to prohibit that behavior, right? Let's read a little bit of scripture. Ezekiel 20, 30 to 32. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus said the master Yahuwah, are you defiling yourselves in the way of your fathers? And do you whore after their abominations? For when you lift up your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols, even to this day. And I shall be inquired by you, O house of Israel, as I live, declares the Master Yahuwah, I am not being inquired by you. And what comes up in your spirit shall never be when you say, let us be like the Gentiles, like the tribes in other lands, serving wood and stone. That was in reference to idols there at the end. I think we can all see that. Deuteronomy 12, 27 to 31. And you shall make your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood, on the altar of Yahuwah your Elohim. And the blood of your offerings is poured out on the altar of Yahuwah your Elohim, and you eat the meat. So that matches up with what we just read in Leviticus 22, 27, what I had said about burnt offerings. I said, pay attention a little bit, because Aharon and his sons were sometimes required to eat the meat. And here he tells him, you eat the meat. Let's finish. Guard and obey all these words which I command you, that it might be well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the eyes of Yahuwah your Elohim. From when Yahuwah your Elohim does cut off before you the nations of which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, guard yourself that you are not ensnared to follow after them, after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, How did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so too. Do not do so to Yahuwah your Elohim for every abomination which Yahuwah hates they have done to their mighty ones for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their mighty ones. Deuteronomy 8, 9. When you come to the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you, do not learn to do according to the abominations of those Gentiles. Let no one be found among you who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That's strange. It keeps mentioning this thing about burning their children in the fires. Seems pretty important for Elohim to keep mentioning that, doesn't it? Let's read a couple more. Leviticus 18.21 And do not give any of your offspring to pass through to Molech, and do not profane the name of your Elohim. I am Yahuwah. Leviticus 20.1-5 And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Say to the children of Israel, Any man of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his offspring to Molech, shall certainly be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I, I shall set my face against that man, and shall cut him off in the midst of his people, because he has given of his offspring to Molech, so as to defile my set-apart place, and to profane my set-apart name. And if the people of the land at all hide their eyes from the man, as he gives any of his offspring to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I shall set my face against that man and his clan, and shall cut him off, and all who go whoring after him, even go whoring after Molech from the midst of their people." So this sounds like anyone who even tolerated that behavior and just let the people pass their children through the fire to Moloch and didn't kill them, they were going to suffer the same fate and have the same punishment as though they did it themselves. 
So why did I just read you all of those verses? Well, let me tell you something. My wife and I recently were studying about this issue, and we thought it had to probably have something to do with the way that the heathens served their other false gods, right? But I just got a book in the mail recently by uh, another guy on Facebook, and he went into this a little bit in his book. We were looking for a particular study, and we didn't know where it was, and he told us where it was, and so we went there and we downloaded the PDF, and it talks all about an archaeological discovery that was made way back in 1928 by a Syrian farmer plowing his field. This guy struck and unearthed a hewn stone with square corners, which turned out to be the cap of a huge underground vault. Early investigation proved unfruitful as they didn't know what they found, and then the work stopped and the investigation was put on hold because World War II popped up and they had to wait till the war was over to start up again in 1950. The excavations to this day are still not completed. I think there's a big percentage of it that still needs to be dug up and documented. This place is named Rosh Shamra, and it's a 60-foot mound that turned out to be an ancient Phoenician city called Ugarit. Maybe some of you heard it before, but it was a remarkable discovery and most pertinent to this video. Now mounds are typically layered and this one had five layers to it. And obviously the deeper you go, the older or the further back in time you're going to go. One of the earliest finds, which had occurred less than a month into their excavations, which was in 1929, they had uncovered a scribal school and a library that had an adjoining temple. And the writings they found on the stone tablets were a mystery until they were finally deciphered by Semitic Hebrew scholars and they were identified to be Ugaritic. To speed this up and get to the meat of the matter, what they ended up finding besides numerous other artifacts besides flint tools and pottery was a literal library that once deciphered turned out to be one of the greatest literary discoveries from antiquity since the deciphering of the Egyptian hieroglyphics and Mesopotamian cuneiform writing. Now, I have told you all of that to get to the point of this video. Many things were discussed in the tablets, and they were told about what these people did in honor of their pagan gods. The religion of Ugarit was very similar to the Canaanites and their religion that the prophets of Yahuwah had constantly denounced. The text showed how there would be temple prostitutes for this religion that would serve in the temple for the Ugaritic priests and the prophets. And about this issue, there's a warning from Yahuwah about it here. In Deuteronomy 23, 17 to 18, none of the daughters of Yisrael is to be a cult prostitute, nor any of the sons of Yisrael to be a cult prostitute. Do not bring the gift of a whore or the pay of a dog to the house of Yahuwah your Elohim for any vowed offering, for both of these are an abomination to Yahuwah your Elohim. So why would Elohim give a command like that? He must have had a good reason for it. Like he thought the people, once they went into the land of the people they were going to dispossess over in Canaan, that they were going to start inquiring about their gods and what they did to serve them. And he wanted to make sure that no matter what, you don't do that unless it is a snare for you. So he wanted to give them reminders. Also, one of the other Ugaritic texts reads, describing what they did over the fire seven times the sacrificers cook a kid in its mother's milk and there you go just as the people would burn their children in the fires to their pagan gods you who wanted to make sure his people did not do as the heathen nations did so these three times that we're told do not boil a young goat in its mother's milk the reminders of sorts and why they don't seem to fit in at times when the other commands are given because they seem like they kind of stick out because he knew they were going to mess up when they got in there. He said, look, once you get into my land and once you screw up and you get kicked out of there. Remember we read in Deuteronomy 18.9, when you come into the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you, do not learn to do according to the abominations of those Gentiles. One more point I want to bring up, which is just food for thought. I'm just kind of asking some questions out loud here. So kind of bear with me. The word sheep is Strong's H6629, Sa'on. It's from an unused root meaning to migrate, a collective name for a flock of sheep of goats, also figuratively of men. So I'm just wondering, just thinking out loud, what if the people who burned their children in the fire to Molech, what if they ran out of children? Or what if there were single people who wanted to appease their God? Or what if there were childless couples? Or there were older people who were a lot of kids and they wanted to continue to appease their God. 
What did they have set up if they didn't have any kids that they could do? Maybe it was boil a young goat in its mother's milk. I don't know. That's just conjecture on my part, and it's, but it's probably worthy of consideration. There was only one time that a lamb or a young goat was acceptable, and that is the Passover, where the instruction was in Exodus 12, 5, let the lamb be a perfect one, a year old male. Take it from the sheep or from the goats. And the command to cook that lamb and eat it is Exodus 12, 8 to 9. And they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water. We're specifically told not to boil it. And that Hebrew word for water, which is maim, doesn't mean just water. It means liquid. So in other words, don't boil it. So there's no confusion in sense religion or the traditions of man usually do the opposite of what Elohim said. He was very clear how the Passover was to be selected, killed, cooked, eaten, and when. Now, I have no idea if this boiling a kid in its mother's milk was any type of a counterfeit Passover or not. Like I said, it's just speculation on my part. We are called to be set apart in all that we do. We are told to not do as the heathen nations do. We are told we are to be a particular people and set apart. To our Elohim. All we do know for sure by this archaeological discovery that was discovered by accident way back in 1928 is this pagan practice of boiling a young goat in its mother's milk was already being done by the nations of Ugarit and Canaan before Yahuwah was going to lead his people into Canaan to displace those people. And Elohim told them not to inquire about their practices and to guard themselves so they did not fall and do the same thing as the heathens did. This has absolutely nothing to do with eating meat and dairy at the same time. Nothing. That part in Genesis where Abraham fed when Yahuwah was present with the messengers and they ate milk and meat together should be proof of that. Psalms 106, 34 to 38 tells us what happened. But they did not destroy the people as Yahuwah had commanded them, but mixed with the Gentiles and learned their works and served their idols. And they became a snare to them, and they slaughtered their sons and their daughters to demons, and they shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they offered to the idols of Canaan, and the land was defiled with blood. Wow, was that sad. I hope this video blessed you. I hope it cleared some matters up. And I know there's going to be some people who will still completely disagree with what I have presented here. Is we all like to cling very hard to our traditions. And it's also why Elohim hates pride. Because most of the time it seems like we'd rather be right than righteous. We have to keep our pride in check. And sometimes we have to swallow our pride and get to feeling uncomfortable. Because that's when the learning happens. When we stop and think. Maybe there's a point there. Thanks to everyone worldwide in the dispersion who is watching our videos. Thanks for spending a small part of your day with us. Shalom from all of us here at Beit Tefillah Productions. Please subscribe if you haven't yet. We sure appreciate everybody who has. Everybody, shalom and have a wonderful day.